Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, it is so good to be among Bereans. You may be seated. When you first said that, Pastor Mark, maybe my uh, mind was thinking back to Veterans Day, but I thought you said Marines are always, and I thought, no, he just said Bereans. So thank God for the Bereans. Thank God for the Marines. Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. Thank God for just everybody. Uh, so good to be back. I've so enjoyed my times here in the past. I think this is my third time to be with you and have absolutely loved every single time. And um, uh, since I was with you last, uh, uh, Pastor Mark reminded me I was with you last October, I believe. And uh, since that time, I, I had just made a trip to the Middle East, and I made another trip back to Turkey, Egypt, and Lebanon this February, where I had just been in August before, and uh, stopped in France on the way there, uh, made a trip to Nigeria, and, and made a trip to Australia, and also made a trip to Greece and Rome. And um, so we've been out and about throughout the different parts of the world and around the country and, and that type of thing. But it's so good to be in Pittsburgh. It's good to be in uh, Steeler country. And, and d did God ordain that that game be at 1 o'clock today so it didn't interfere with church tonight? I think, I think that was a divine... Uh, anyway, I'll leave that one alone. But anyway, um, you, you mentioned our books. Thank you so much. We have a slide here of, of our books that we want to ask uh, be put up. The center stack are the books in English. And what we're really excited about are the stacks on the left and the right. And more and more nations are picking those up, you know, getting permission, getting them translated, using them in different uh, Bible schools and uh, to train ministers. You know, many countries don't have the, the training opportunities that we have here in, in the U.S., and so we've had new books come out even since that picture was taken. Uh, we just had a book come out in Nepali, uh, we have one coming out in Hindi very shortly. And so uh, we're just thankful to, uh, you know, have that part and, and have that involvement. Uh, one of the places that I just visited a few weeks ago was Berea. And um, uh, this is the road sign. Um, you know, it's a modern city today, and um, they've kind of, it, you know, when I, I've, I've done um, eight tours of the biblical sites in uh, Greece and Turkey and Rome and Israel and different places, and uh, this time we had 32 people. Uh, we just got back from that a few weeks ago, and we always, if we're in Greece, if we're in the northern part of Greece, we always swing by Berea. That's, how, that's an Anglicanized version, and uh, Pastor Mark and I, he actually pronounced it probably more biblically yesterday, Veria is something like that. When I preach in Greece, I just always get hesitant because, you know, I, I never say the original Greek says <laughs> because the interpreter knows the Greek, and uh, I've, I don't want to be too embarrassed, so I don't even know how some things, like when we were in F F Philippi, our guide kept saying F Philippi, Philippi. And so I told our group that, um, you know, please understand our guide doesn't know the original Oklahoman. <laughs> so she's mispronouncing it, you know, so no, they know the, how, how it's pronounced. So this is the roadside uh, to... Uh, again, I don't even want to guess how you say it, but we say Berea, all right? That's what we say. And um, uh, when, when we were there, um, there's a, a beautiful little port city. Let's look at the next slide if we could. There's a, uh, oh, I didn't use that. I'm using that tonight, disregard. I'm going to show you some additional pictures tonight. Um, but when you go into Berea tonight, I'm going to show you just a few pictures. It's not the whole message. It's just a few minutes. Um, but um, uh, if we could go back to the first, uh, the next one, if we could, the next one. There we go. There is a, okay, go back, go back. There we go. That one right there. 
there is a monument there that it's a modern monument. It's not ancient. And one of the things you run into in visiting these cities, like this time we were in Athens, we were in Corinth, we were in Philippi, um, we're in Thessalonica. Today they call Thessalonica Thessaloniki, but it's the same place. In some of these cases, there's a modern city that they just built on top. You know, it's kind of like lasagna. You know, they just start with one. I didn't mean to get people thinking about lunch, but they just, they just start, you know, here's the ancient civilization, and then they come in hundreds of years later to build on top, and then another generation comes in and builds on top, and they just, whether it's earthquakes or you know, invasions and armies destroy it. It's, it's easier just to build on top of it than it is to clear it all out. And so Berea is one of those places where most of the ancient elements of, that Paul would have seen are underground because they built on top. But do you see in the very middle of that, do you see some steps there? Can you see those steps? Those are, that is ancient. Those looks like two or three, three steps, it looks like. Um, those are three steps from the first century. And they say that, I can't prove it one way or the other, but they say that those were the steps to the synagogue and that Paul would have preached from those steps. And um, so that is one touch of antiquity uh, that you have there. But uh, the, the mosaics on either side and then the center, let's go to the next slide if we could. Um, this is a, a, a mosaic showing Paul over in ancient Troas, and he's having the vision of the man from Macedonia, northern Greece, saying, come over here and help us. So that's on the left side of that big, big monument that you saw. The next slide after that is on the far right side, and that's Paul actually preaching to the people in Berea. And you'll notice, uh, and they have those steps there that he's supposedly standing on when he preached there. And do you see the book? Let me get here. So you see the book lying in front of the people and the person on the right, uh, the lower right, the red garment holding a scroll. See, that's what the Bereans did. They checked the word to see if the things that Paul said were true. And so uh, the reason um, that, that people will name churches and, and ministries Berea and is because they want to be like this group of disciples that um, they're not just gullible. They don't just believe what anybody says. They check the Bible. And um, so Paul had a great time there until some angry people came from another, at Thessalonica and, you know, they'd run him out of their city and then they came and ran him out of Berea. But they were actually some wonderful believers. And when Paul left Berea, he actually left behind uh, Silas and Timothy to encourage them in their faith and things like that. And then Paul went on to Athens. We have a couple of other pictures here uh, from Berea. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, there you see, these are actually two different pictures that I just put side by side. The center, again, you see those three steps um, from the first century, and there's another modern uh, uh, mosaic of Paul uh, in that city. So it's kind of a neat place to uh, just step and just touch history for a moment. I think we have one final slide. Uh, they have, uh, as you're going into that area, they quote um, Acts 17 and 11. In Berea, they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. And so I just thought you might want to see a couple sites of what you see if you actually go to the modern city of Berea or Veria or however else anybody else might pronounce it. It's still the same place, all right? Um, but tonight, I'm going to just show you a couple pictures, just like we did now, not take more than a few minutes, and show you the port that Paul sailed into when he came to Europe for the first time. 
the, what the road was like leading into Philippi. Uh, we, our group actually walked on the first century road. It's called the Via Ignatia or the Ignatian Way uh, that Paul walked in when he walked from the port city over to Philippi. We'll show you some pictures of um, Thessalonica, that type of thing, some pictures of Philippi and all that. So um, do you like, is that okay to see that? Uh, you know, I know back in the day, the worst thing that could ever happen is you could go to somebody's house and they'd say, oh, we thought you, we'd show you some uh, family videos from our movie or movies, videos from our family vacation. And like, oh, you know, Please no. But um, anyway, hope it's not like that. I want to share with you from, uh, as Pastor Mark was so kind to mention, our, our brand new book, it's called Magnificent Jesus. And the subtitle of the book is, is Unmatched, Unrivaled, Unparalleled. And uh, this book for me was probably the most enjoyable book that I ever wrote because every time I write, I put a lot of study and research into it and, and things like that. And what, what better topic to write about than the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I grew up in a mainline traditional type of denomination. And I want you to understand I'm, I'm extremely grateful for my background. I'm thankful that I was taught the Ten Commandments. How many of you are thankful for the Ten Commandments? You know, people say, well, we can't be saved by the Ten Commandments. <laughs> no, but you can have a better neighborhood. <laughs> if people, I, I want my neighbor to believe in the Ten Commandments. Um, it creates a better life, you know. Um, I'm thankful that I lear learned the Lord's Prayer. I'm thankful that I learned uh, the Beatitudes. I'm thankful that I learned the Apostles' Creed. You know, there's a lot of rich things that I learned. And then I learned things from kind of the historic standpoint. I knew about Jesus being born. I knew about Jesus being, you know, his life, his teachings, his miracles. Uh, knew about his death, knew about his resurrection and so on. But something about it was missing for me in that it was basically information only. I don't want to. I don't want to throw shade on information because we need information. The Bible says God said my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So I don't want to, in any way, shape, or form, diminish or or negate the importance of knowing information. But we need information that is quickened by the person and the power of the Holy Spirit. So that it's not just information in the head, but it's revelation in the heart. People can have, a, you know, the devil has information. You know, the devil knows that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and that he was crucified on Calvary and that he was raised from the dead. But the devil has no transformation because information alone without the quickening power of the Holy Spirit and a receptive heart to believe and a willingness to be transformed, I believe God has, yes, the Bible is full of information, but it's transformational information. And, and that we need to know Jesus personally. How many of you are like me? You, you had knowledge about Jesus before he became real in your heart. Let me see your hand. Uh, tons of hands. Um, and so I want to talk to you today about uh, knowing Jesus. I'm not talking about knowing him out beyond the Bible and some extra biblical information you know, some mysterious secret of information. I'm just talking about letting the Holy Spirit show us who he really is in the depth of his character, in, in the fullness of his magnificence and majesty. There, there was a lady who, who lived years ago, and uh, she was an amazing Bible teacher. Her name was Henrietta Mears. And she was a Sunday school teacher in Southern California. And if I'm not mistaken, she was influential and mentored people like Billy Graham and Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade. And this is what she told ministers to do. She said, make Christ magnificent 
in the eyes of men. Make Christ magnificent in the eyes of men. And it makes me wonder how many people have some basic information about Jesus, but they really kind of find it boring. It's just kind of, oh yeah, I heard about that in Sunday school, or I heard about that from some preacher, or whatever. But, but there's never been a spark to it. There's never been anything that has caused them to just be in awe and, and, and in majesty just drop to their knees, either physically or figuratively, and just be amazed at who Jesus is. You know, one of the um, early church great people in church history was a guy named Augustine. Everybody heard of Augustine? If you haven't heard of Augustine, you've at least heard of the city in Florida, St. Augustine, that's named after him. But Augustine, in, in church history, uh, was a, he was self-admittedly a really bad sinner. Now, you know, we, in, in our human viewpoint, we, we classify people as good sinners and bad sinners, right? You know, so here's a guy that's, oh, he's killed people, and he's, you know, I was preaching in one, one church in, in South America, and the pastor said, see that guy over there, my head usher? And I said, yeah. And he said, he killed 27 people before he got saved. You know, and I'm thinking, wow, I bet, I bet his ushers follow his instructions, <laughs> you know. But, but this man had been born again. He was a new person in Christ, you know, and, and, and he, he, he'd been changed on the inside. But see, if somebody's killed a bunch of people or robbed banks or done, you know, well, they're bad sinners. But if somebody else, you know, they've lived a pretty good life, they think, well, I'm, you know, maybe I've sinned, but I'm not as bad as that guy. You know, but you understand, the, the Bible says if we offend in one point, we are guilty of the whole thing. If, if James 2.10, if we offend in one point of the law, we might as, I'm not saying, well, okay, go on a, a sinning spree, you know, because it doesn't matter anymore. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying that everybody needs forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That's why we say, you know, you can't be good enough to earn your way to heaven, but you can't have been so bad that you've outrun the reach of God's love and God's mercy either. You understand what we're saying? But Augustine was admittedly a, a bad sinner. He, he just loved to sin. And um, at one point when, you know, God was kind of dealing with him about his life changing and things like that. One of his prayers was, God, make me holy, but not yet. <laughs> God, make me holy, chaste. He used the word chaste, but not yet. And um, see, when people are blinded, when, when the Bible says that Satan has blinded the minds of those that don't believe, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. People actually think that sin is fun. And, and the Bible says that sin is fun, but only for a season. Uh, Hebrews talks about how Moses chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Satan will always show people the short-range pleasure of sin, but he won't show them the long-range sorrow of sin. Because sin is always going to hurt people in the long run. Um, hurt the person doing it, hurt the people affected by it. Um, but, but Augustine, you know, having been, you know, you know the, the type of person he was, he said, in my deepest woundedness, I saw your glory and it dazzled me. I saw your glory and it dazzled me. And it makes me wonder how many people have just a superficial knowledge of Jesus, but they've really never been, and, and I, we, I don't know that anybody, how many, probably it's been a decade since you've used the word, how many of you use the word dazzled this week? I don't think we use that word. I was preaching this here a while back in Canada, and the pastor was very young, and I shared this quote, Augustine, in my deepest woundedness, I saw your glory, and it dazzled me. And I, I turned to him and I said, Joel, what, what word do young people use? And he said, lit. 
And I said, okay, Jesus lit you. So I, I don't know. I'm way too old for that. But I, I hope that's as appropriate here as it was there. But, but, you know, whatever words you would use when something just blows you away, that, that you're just awestruck. Uh, that's what Augustine uh, said about Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, Christ is the great central fact in the world's history. Uh, you mentioned being a, a history teacher, history major. Uh, Christ is the, oh, you mentioned a history teacher you had. Christ is the great central fact in the world's history. To him, everything looks forward or backward. All the lines of history converge upon him. You know, he, he's the one that split B.C. from A.D. Now, in modern times, they've tried to secularize that, and what do they make it, B.C.E. and C.E.? But, but we know what they're, you know, trying to neutralize there. So I want to talk today about Jesus, his centrality, how he is the great central fact in the world's history. I want to talk about how can Jesus be more amazing to us, how he can be magnificent in our eyes. I want to talk about um, maybe us being lit uh, by his light. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. But anyway... Um, what would Jesus say? Stop and think about this. If Jesus were to show up, and let's just paint a hypothetical, but it really did happen. Jesus has been raised from the dead. I'm going back 2,000 years ago. Let's pretend we're there, and it just happened. And let's say that we are among his disciples, and they were hyper-traumatized. They had been following Jesus for three, three and a half years, and, and they were expecting him to become the king of Israel. They were expecting him to uh, eradicate the corruption within the religious system. They were expecting him to repel the oppressive government of Rome. Uh, they were expecting him to be uh, very different than what he turned out to be, and they see him crucified. They saw him brutally beaten, whipped, scourged. Uh, they saw his lifeless body taken down from the grave. They saw him wrapped and put in the manger. And then the next thing you know, a few days later, these women, these women come running and saying, he, he, the grave is empty. He's not there. And... Um, so uh, there's a whole long story that we're not going to go into, but that night, Jesus appeared to the disciples. And they'd been getting these reports now. Peter and John had had a you know, situation there, and the, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus had come and said, we, 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 just, we, just, we just saw Jesus. You know, they were out of breath because... You know, they'd run, it was just, and, and they're just kind of like, we don't know what's going on. And so Jesus shows up. And, you know, they're, they're terrified. They're in a locked room because they're afraid that the Romans are going to come after them and that they're going to be next. Well, Jesus did a couple things when he encountered them. The first thing Jesus did was he showed them his wounds. He showed them the holes in his hand, showed them the holes in his side, because Jesus wanted them to understand. See, they thought they were seeing a ghost. They thought, well, this is some kind of metaphysical experiment, experience or something of that nature. And Jesus showed them tangibly, physically, the, the evidence of him having just been crucified. Because Jesus wanted them to know that he had been raised from the dead physically. This is not a, an ethereal thing. This is not a vision. This is not a dream. Uh, this is not metaphysical. This is tangible, you know, as tangible as the chair you're sitting on and as tangible as the, you know, 
table I'm, I'm pounding my fist on up here. This is real. And you know what the second thing he did was? He said, do you have anything to eat? Now, I noticed during, you know, some of the announcements you were saying, what did you say there? Goodies, what, what goodies are there? Pastries and fruit and things like that. See, church hasn't changed. In 2,000 years, Christians have, it is, it is really illegal for Christians to get together and not have food. Unless it's a fasting conference. That's the only exception. No, I'm kidding. But um, the first thing Jesus said after he said, look, look at my wounds and put your hands and touch. See, it's really me. I'm not a ghost. Is he said, do you have anything to eat? Well, they'd forgotten the pastries. Uh, but they said, well, we, we do have some fish. And Jesus ate it. And um, again, Jesus wanted them to understand this deal is real. This deal is physical because Jesus knew that at some point in the future, somebody was going to come along and say, well, that's all spiritual. That's just metaphorical. You know, that's just, it's just a spiritual thing to illustrate. And, and Jesus wanted them to know this is 100% tangible, real, and physical. And then the next thing Jesus did, listen to this, it's on the screen. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 45. Then he said, when I was with you before, well, he's talking about his three, three and a half years. When I was with you before, I told you that everything, everybody say everything. everything. Now, if, if there had just been one thing said about him, would he have said everything? Everything implies that there's probably a lot, right? Everything written about me in the law of Moses. Well, what's, what's the law of Moses? That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. How many of you know that's a lot? Everything Jesus said that was written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets. How many of you know that's a lot? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, and then, and then all of the, what we call the minor prophets, all the way through Malachi, and, the, and in the Psalms. How many of you know that's 150 chapters? Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, which at that time was only the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, Jesus had just been raised from the dead, so the New Testament was yet to be written. I'm going to propose this. Until you understand that the Old Testament was about Jesus your mind is not open to understand the Scriptures. What, what did that look like? What did that look like? I, I want to share with you something else here, because we see this thing repeated again in uh, Acts chapter 28. Look at the screen. You'll see another Scripture. When Paul, this is now at the very end of the book of Acts, it says, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. Well, he had a place to live. He was under house arrest. A large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the Scriptures. Using the law of Moses... And the book of the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until the evening. Starting in Genesis, going all the way through to the book of Malachi. If you have a tangible Bible in your hands, I know so many of us use devices now, but if you have a physical Bible in your hands, go to Genesis and then go to Malachi. That's a huge, massive amount of biblical content. 
He persuaded them about Jesus from the Old Testament from when? From morning until evening. I'm not saying I could do it because Paul's mastery of things was way beyond mine. But if I started in Genesis, I'd have to do a lot of digging and studying and preparing. But we could take you through, you know, start in Genesis and show you how Jesus is prophesied, predicted, promised, prefigured. You know, for example, Genesis right after the fall of man. God made this statement, the seed of a woman, this is in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis 3, God said, the seed of a woman will crush the head of the serpent. That's called the first preaching of the gospel in the Old Testament. Um, You you could go to Numbers where um, when the, the poisonous serpents were biting the children of Israel and they were getting sick and dying, God said, Moses, take a bronze serpent and stick it up on a pole and lift it up, and anybody that's bitten will be healed. Well, Jesus, when he came, said, as Moses lifted up the serpent on the brazen serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And do you know what Jesus said right after that? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. When Jesus gave the most popular, the most famous Bible verse in the world, the verse before, Jesus was talking about how He was like the brazen bronze serpent. Now, Sometimes people would say, well, I don't get that because Jesus was the sinless, spotless. He's the lamb of God. Why why didn't God have a lamb put on a pole? Well, he could have, but on the cross, Jesus bore our sin. He bore our iniquity. He bore the curse. The Bible says God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So on the cross, Jesus wasn't there in in and of his intrinsic self because in, in and of himself, he is the sinless, spotless son of God. But on the cross, he was the sin bearer. He was our substitute. We could go all the way through the Old Testament, like Paul did, from morning until evening, and Paul used the Old Testament to point out the hundreds of prophecies and predictions and promises about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus kind of did something similar, and it was then that their minds were opened to the Scripture. Let me share this with you. Here's another way to kind of present the same thing. I I, I like kind of bullet points, one, two, three. I'm kind of a systematic type thinker. The Old Testament. Everybody say Old Testament. The Old Testament is preparation for Jesus Christ. Now, now it contains all kinds of history, stories of families, stories of individuals, stories of nations, you know, all kinds. But but it's primarily the Old Testament. The purpose of it, the divine purpose of the Old Testament is preparation for Jesus. The Gospels are the manifestation of Jesus. It's when Jesus actually shows up. You know, we're coming up on the Christmas season. I love the Christmas season. You know, long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appears and the soul felt its worth. You know, the the Gospels are the manifestation when the promised one showed up and, and, you know, for those 33 and a half years lived and walked among humanity. The book of Acts is the propagation of Jesus. 
propagation, we could say proclamation, the spreading of his message, you know, how the uh, earliest Christians took his message, as Jesus had said, it's starting in Jerusalem, that city, then to Judea, the state, then to Samaria, that's the nearby region where, you know, we don't like those people and they don't really like us. How many of you know Jesus expected us to, to, through his love, bring down all the barriers and hindrances of prejudice and and things of that nature, and then under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's Rome. That was the capital of the Gentile world. And then the epistles are the explanation of Jesus' work. The explanation of Jesus' work. See, in the, in the Gospels, the Gospels are kind of like a photograph of what happened You know, we see what Jesus did, what he said. But in the epistles, it's kind of like an x-ray or an MRI. We see what's behind, what's beneath the surface. In the Gospels, for example, we see that Jesus was uh, died on the cross. But in the epistles, we find out what that means to us. We find out the meaning and the application. And then finally, the book of Revelation is the consummation of his kingdom. That's where all of the loose ends get tied together. You know, there's a lot of people, and um, you know, I appreciate what you know Pastor Mark said and 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 what our sister said about you know praying for and and uh, the church has a mission in the world. We're here to be salt. We're here to be light. Uh, we're here to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and um, but we we live in a world that it's always been full of chaos. But but it seems to us like it's more chaotic perhaps than before. I know it sure seems more chaotic than when I was a little kid growing up in north central Indiana in a little farming town of, you know, 2,000 people, where to me life, but maybe some of that's my age too. Maybe if I'd been an adult at that age, I'd have been thinking, oh, it's all coming apart back then. I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, the world is full of chaos. Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world And that's why we don't need to fall apart when the world falls apart. Um, Jesus is is ruling and reigning in heaven now, but the Bible teaches there's a time where he's going to tie all the loose ends together and there's going to be ultimate and absolute victory. And if you want to know what that looks like, read the book of Revelation. If you want to know what that means, ask Pastor Mark, and he'll tell you, he'll tell you what it means. But, um, you know, Jesus is not pacing the floor of heaven right now, wondering if he's going to pull this thing off or not. Uh, Jesus is going to uh, rule and reign eternally, and we're going to rule and reign with him. Uh, so, so I like that. If This is part of understanding the Bible if you'll understand that the Old Testament is preparing the way for Jesus, the Gospels are when he actually showed up. The book of Acts is when his message went out. The letters, the epistles, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, etc., that's where it, we, we get the explanation or the understanding of, of everything Jesus did. And the revelation is where he ties all the loose ends together. Do you know... It, I think it would be humanly impossible for around 40 different authors, human authors, over a period of 1,500 years to write different portions that come together in one book that we call the Bible of such amazing unity and harmony. I mean, the Bible, it's, it's just, it's, you know, you, if you didn't know better, you'd almost think it was inspired by God. <laughs> we do know better, and it was inspired by God. 
And it, it went many times even beyond the understanding of what the people were writing themselves. But anyway, there is a song. I am not going to sing this, but I, I'm going to give you the words to it. And you can look this up on YouTube. The name of the song is simply called, He Is. He Is. And it's a father-son team uh, named Aaron Jeffrey. I used to think it was one guy named Aaron Jeffrey, but it's actually a father and son. And they use um, each of their first names, Aaron Jeffrey. And what they did was they went through every book of the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. And they went through and identified a key theme in that book of the Bible, how Christ, when we come back tonight, we're, we're going to talk about how Jesus, among other things, we're going to talk about how Jesus operated before Bethlehem. If you think that Jesus didn't exist until Bethlehem, you're going to love tonight because we're going to find out how Jesus has eternally existed. And the Bible is so clear and so concrete. And, and we're going to look at just some really amazing things tonight. But, but here's what they wrote. In Genesis, He is the breath of life. In Exodus, He's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, He's our high priest. In Numbers, the fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's Moses' voice. In Joshua, he is salvation's choice. In Judges, the lawgiver. In Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is sovereign. In Ezra, he's the true and faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of broken walls and lives. In Esther, he is Mordecai's courage. In Job, the timeless redeemer. In Psalms, he is our morning song. In Proverbs, he's wisdom's cry. In Ecclesiastes, he's the time and seasons. In Song of Solomon, he is the lover's dream. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. In Lamentations, the cry for Israel. In Ezekiel, he's the call from sin. In Daniel, he's the stranger in the fire. In Hosea, he is forever faithful. In Joel, he's the Spirit's power. In Amos, he's the arms that carry us. In Obadiah, He's the Lord, our Savior. In Jonah, he's the great missionary. In Micah, the promise of peace. In Nahum, he is our strength and our shield. In Habakkuk and Zephaniah, he is pleading for revival. In Haggai, he restores the lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is our fountain. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he is God, man, Messiah. In Acts, he is fire from heaven. In Romans, he's the grace of God. In Corinthians, the power of love. In Galatians, he is freedom from the curse of sin. In Ephesians, he's our glorious treasure. In Philippians, he is the servant's heart. In Colossians, he is the Godhead Trinity. In Thessalonians, our coming king. In Timothy, Titus, and Philemon, he's our mediator and our faithful pastor. In Hebrews, the everlasting covenant. In James, the one who heals the sick. In First and Second Peter, he is our shepherd. In John and in Jude, he is the lover coming for his bride. And in the Revelation, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I love that. We want Jesus to be magnificent in your eyes. We want him to seem so massive, 
powerful, big, awesome. We want you to know he's all the omnis. He's omnipotent. He's, you know, omniscient. Uh, we just want you to know how amazing Jesus is. And uh, so thank God, you know, if, if all that a person ever knows is that God loved the world so much that he sent Jesus and that Jesus was born and that Jesus lived and he died for our sins and rose from the dead. And, and see, that's enough right there. If you don't know anything other than Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. We're not trying to um, take anything away from the simplicity of the basic, simple message that Christ died for our sins and was raised from the dead according to the Scriptures. If that's all you know, that's enough to go to heaven with. But I'll tell you what, there, there's just more to Him than that. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to teach us about your Son and to reinforce and to bring application of all that Jesus did on the cross uh, when he died for us. And Lord, we just thank you for that precious blood that was shed so that we could be forgiven. And Lord, we just want to thank you right now uh, that, that we can know you. Lord, your word talks about growing in the knowledge of, of, of you and of Jesus our Lord and how grace and peace are multiplied. Lord, we don't ever want to move beyond the basics, but we do want to build upon the basics. Uh, we never want to uh, make light of the basic foundational truths, but we want to build upon those basic foundational truths, and not just to know the milk of the word, but to know the, the bread and the meat of the word that moves us into maturity through a, a profound and deep and full knowledge of you. Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Lord, right now, I pray for your people. Jesus, you are greater than any problem that any people in here are facing. Lord, you are the, the Prince of Peace over troubled lives and hearts. You are, you are Jehovah uh, Rapha. You are the Lord, our healer. And Lord, we just thank you right now for just releasing power and, and giving wisdom. The Bible says that Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. Jesus, be exalted in and over the lives of every person that's here today. And just with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask this question. How many of you would say to me, Tony, I've, I know Jesus. You know, I'm not saying that you know everything. I'm not saying I know everything. I hope I'm learning more about him every day. But how many of you would say with uplifted hand, Tony, I know enough about Jesus that I have surrendered my life to him. He is my savior. I'm trusting in him for my eternal life. Let me see your hand if that's you all over this place. You know Jesus that much. You know him that well. Praise God. Let, just go ahead and put your hands down just in case. How many, is there anybody here that would say, Tony, man, I'd, I'd love to know that. I, I want to know this Jesus more. I want to come into a relationship with him. Or, or maybe you'd say, you know, I've never accepted Jesus, or you would say, I accepted him at one time, but man, I've gotten away from him. I've been, you know, out doing my own thing. I'm a prodigal. Uh, I need to come back to Father's house. You either need to accept Jesus for the first time, or you need to rededicate your life. I'd love to lead us in a prayer along those lines. Let me see your hand if that's you. You need Jesus for the first time, or you need to rededicate your life to him this morning. I'm looking all over this place. If that's you, man, there's no better time than to do it than right now, this moment. How many of you, how many of you with uplifted hand would say, Tony, I, I'm good with God. I, Jesus is my Savior and Lord, but I know somebody. I have a friend, a neighbor, relative, co-worker, 
that needs Jesus. And man, let's just take a minute to pray for them. How many of you know somebody like that? Let's pray for them. Father, Jesus said to pray that laborers would be sent into the, into the harvest field. Lord, we aren't better than anybody else. Lord, we're blessed. But Lord, we pray for the people that haven't discovered this good news that we've been talking about this morning, people that need Jesus. And Lord, we lift up, I want you to call out their name to God right now. Just call out their name, whether it's Mary or Bill or Frank or Sue. Lord, we call these people out to you right now. And we ask that the power of Satan would be broken over their life that's blinding their minds to see the light of the glorious gospel. And Lord, we pray that laborers will be sent across their path. Lord, if that's us, thank you for giving us uh, wisdom and sensitivity of how to you know, minister to them and build connections with them. And, and just, uh, But Lord, we're asking for there to be a harvest of people that we have the privilege of harvesting in the name of Jesus. We believe that people will be coming into the kingdom of God and that you're going to use us as you will or others as you will but we'll be sensitive to the leading and the direction of the Holy Spirit. And we lift these people up to you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Pastor Mark, would you come on up?